Right. So offering an S1000D, um, we obviously had a look last week at a kind of an intro, general sort of high level look at S1000D and what some of the principles and stuff were. So I don't intend repeating too much this week in terms of kind of intro matter and stuff like that. Um, what we are going to look at over the next hour or so, some of the basic construction um, principles of S1000D. Uh, I'm going to have a look in a little bit more detail at the ID and status. And if you don't know what that is, you will shortly. Um, we'll also have a, uh, a bit of a chat about different content types and how and where they fit in. And then also we will look at things like graphics and other media and how that works with S1000D. And then along the way, this is not going to be kind of death by PowerPoint this week. Along the way, I will have a look at some examples of some data and uh, we will then kind of finish up with looking at some of the tools that are available for offering a couple of different uh, ones that we provide. Um, and it's not so much for me to sit here and just demo our tool set, but for you guys to understand what difference using proper offering tools makes when you're using something as potentially complicated as S1000. And I say potentially, because hopefully over the course of the next hour, um, you will see that as long as you've got the right kind of environment set up, then actually it doesn't have to be that difficult and it's not this big scary monster. So it is aimed at technical authors. Um, a little warning, you might see some real live XML during the afternoon, um, but even if you're not specifically a technical author, there is hopefully some useful information in here, certainly when we get to looking at sort of tool set type stuff, you know, so if you're a tech pubs manager uh, or you're leading a team of technical authors and you want to understand the kind of tools and the things that they need to support their work, then hopefully there's some good content in here this afternoon to cover that as well. Right, moving swiftly into the main body of the presentation then. So as we spoke about last week, S1000D mandates the use of SGML and XML. And, and to be honest, for most of the afternoon now, or, or morning your time out in the States, obviously, but afternoon my time here, um, I will just talk about XML. Virtually everything that I say about XML equally applies to SGML. Um, there are some subtle differences in the way it's constructed down at file level and at the way the rules of how it are created are, are put together. But from an authoring perspective, uh, and certainly from the tool set perspective, there's very little difference from an SGML um, file to an XML file. And certainly the general, in general, the things that you will need to do as an author will not change. So I would just talk about XML, but the two are, for your purposes, pretty much interchangeable. So what is XML? What's the whole point of it? Well, it's just plain text. That has some massive benefits. It means we can open it in just about anything, whether it's Word, whether it's Notepad. There are some really good specialist XML and SGML tools out there where we can open it and do a bit more clever stuff. And then finally, when we get to kind of the full authoring environments, um, some of the big kind of heavyweight, if you like, aerospace and defense tools that have been around for a long time, like FrameMaker from Adobe, like uh, Arbitex from PTC. Um, and things like Oxygen as well. Um, and, and those three I've mentioned particularly because we do have plugins for all of those, and I will show you some of that later on. Um, but any XML tool generally is going to be able to open an XML file because it's just plain text. The, what, what we do with it then is we use what are known as tags to create the elements. And the whole point of that markup is that we are adding intelligence to our content. So rather than just being a piece of text, and I, I have to say this with caution, for years I've been saying that that text doesn't mean anything to a computer. With AI kind of coming around a corner, it might be in the future that this all changes, that we no longer need things like XML because the computer may be able to read and understand the content. But we're not there yet. And for our purposes in delivering our tech pubs, then we need to give the computer that added intelligence to the content. I always get people to think about elements as a container. So we have an opening and a closing tag, and I'm going to look at this very briefly in a minute. I don't want to go too deep into kind of what XML is, but I think it's good for you as authors to have 
that base level of understanding. Um, there are times that things can go wrong. You know, even with the best tool set in the world, there are times, um, you know, maybe you've had a crash, maybe you've done a, a strange cut and paste and your XML can get, if you like, broken. It can get confused. So if you've got the basic wherewithal of how the XML is built, you can actually go and look at it, if you like, under the hood, go and look at it in something like Notepad++. And I'm going to show you this a bit. And when we post the video online later on for the um, presentation, I'm going to put some links below that video, video for some of the tools that I've been using so that you can go and have a look at them. Alongside the, the contents of an element, which is our content, that's the bit that we're actually writing, then we can also have attributes on our elements and those attributes are used to provide some additional information. Now, all of those rules are what come from S1000D. So there's XML is a, is a global standard. It's part of the World Wide Web's consortiums languages, if you like. So it's a, a, a sibling to HTML that drives the web. And often your content from your XML will end up on a web page through various transforms. So there's nothing clever, nothing special about XML. The difference is that when we do S1000D, we are following S1000D's rule set. And they've designed it, they've created it to, um, to work together. And so this is one of the big reasons why we can't just go and write any old element tags. We have to use the ones that are provided by S1000D. So let's have a very quick look at some of this XML markup. So the tags just appear in line with N in the text um, and they show the system, if you like, the different kinds of data. And then, as I say, we can have those attributes to refine it. So the tag we delimit with these little angle brackets. The tag always starts with its name uh, uh, just inside the opening angle bracket. If there are any attributes, then they follow that opening name and then we close the name. That, if you like, is the opening tag. We then have a content and then we have the closing tag. And the closing tag is almost the same. It's the same tag name. It's just that it has that slash symbol inside the opening bracket, and that tells the system that it's ended. Tags can be nested inside each other, um, but what you can't do is you can't have tags kind of overlapping, so you don't start one inside one and finish inside another. Always think of them as containers, and then you won't go far wrong. If you look at raw XML when it's written out, you'll often see that people indent it. The system doesn't need it indented, but from a visual point of view for you as a user, that can help you kind of understand um, where your opening and closing tags and where your containers are. So this little example on screen, this is it's obviously a memo because the opening tag says memo. And this might be used in some kind of information system. So, you know, you as a user will probably have a nice form that you fill in. You'll fill in the to um, block, you'll fill in the from block or maybe the from block is filled in automatically for you on your system. Um, there might be a, you know, if you think of like an email, there might be a title field automatically there. You just fill in the title and then you start writing your content. And you can see there with the way I've kind of nested it that memo contains absolutely everything. We then have that date field. Um, the date field uses attributes. So that's the day equals zero one, the month equals zero two, rather than just writing the date in text. That may or may not be a good thing. It entirely depends on your system and how your system's defined. Now that date container is an interesting one because if you look, there is no, if you like, ending date tag. Because there's no actual physical text content to go inside the date, we've done it all in the attributes, then we don't need a closing tag. So we have that little special uh, notation at the end there where the slash appears inside the closing angle bracket. And then I think the rest of the fields there are quite straightforward. We have the opening to, it's to you, and we have the closing to. We have the opening from, from me, and the closing one. And then you can see the body. So the body actually contains a title and a couple of paragraphs. And as I say, the indentation there, I done it on screen just so you can kind of get that feeling of containers, get the feeling of the fact that things are nested inside each other. Now, 
hopefully from looking at that example on screen, you, you can look at that and, you know, pretty obviously you can say it's a memo. It's to you. It's from me. It's got a title. The title is Hello. The first paragraph is this is a memo from me to you. So it's really easy to understand. And actually, most of the XML is like that. And one of the things I want you as authors to be is not scared of occasionally actually looking at the XML when you need to. And if something is broken, the fact that you can go in there and fix it is a good thing. And we will look at a bit more XML. We'll look at some, some real S1000D XML in a little while. One of the other big things I want to get across to you as authors is that if you've never used structured authoring before, so if you've never worked with XML and SGML, if you've only ever done things in maybe Word or in design or unstructured for a maker, then there is a change of mindset. And that change of mindset can be both frustrating and liberating. The, the frustrating bit is because you are constrained by the structures that you have. And there might be times that you think, oh, why can't I put that after that? Why can't this contain one of those? Well, because someone somewhere has decided they don't want that and you are limited by the structure. But when you use structure, because we are giving our content this additional intelligence, and we're completely divorcing it from the formatting. You know, there is no format information in our text file. It's not like a word file where you make a heading bold and centered and underlined or whatever. Because of that, it means that I can reuse my content over and over again in all sorts of different places. The typical one with S1000D and what it's really mainly designed for is what's known as the Interactive Electronic Technical Publication, the IETP. And the IETP is just a big database of all your content that can be displayed to the user and it will have nice links so he can click on a link, whether that's in maybe an index or whether it's from uh, one bit of data to another bit of data and he can navigate around and he can consume that information. And we have to remember as authors that our absolute bottom line, the reason we do all of this is for our users to consume our information. So. Always bear that in mind, you know, that's the most critical bit. But from the formatting point of view, it might be that our user, our reader, doesn't have this interactive electronic technical publication. And so maybe I need to print it, whether that's to a PDF or actually to physical paper. Or it might be that he is somewhere out in the middle of a field, in the middle of a foreign country, and all he's got is his mobile phone. Or it might be that he doesn't even have a mobile phone and that he's just got a landline telephone, but he can dial into a computer that can read him the information he needs. All of these are possible with structured information because the system understands the difference between, say, a, you know, a step. And, and if you think of like a crew drill, which is which is my background as aircrew, we used to do what we call challenge and response. Somebody would read out the challenge, you know, check this control, and the pilot would check it if necessary, do an action, and he would respond with the answer. You can do that over a telephone using XML because the system can read you the challenge, and you can, you know, it might be that you don't necessarily have to read back and have a recognized response, but you can do the action and say, right, next step. And whether that's pressing a button on the telephone or whether that's just actually saying next step, the system will then read you the next step. So that's a long, long way away from a guy sat behind a computer in a nice comfy armchair reading his aircrew manual or in his maintenance manual, whatever it happens to be. But all of these are possible from the same single piece of content. And so because of that, because of not having to worry about formatting, that's the kind of liberating bit. Yes, we're constrained by the structures. We have to follow the rules that have been given to us by S1000D. But from a offering point of view, the content is king. You can just get on and concentrate and focus on producing really good content. So your focus is on your user, the words that you're going to give to him and not worry about how it's presented, because every time it's presented might be completely different. You know, you may have no control at all over the presentation to the end user. OK. You can tell I get excited about this kind of thing. Right. Let's have a little think about 
S1000D itself then and the structure of the data modules. So every data module, um, and I say every, we have lots of different types of data modules, and I'm going to come on to that in a minute, but every type of data module has two parts. There's an initial management part, which um, tells us all about um, that data module's history and governance and, and current status, and then there's the actual content. And the content comes in different types, as we'll look at in a minute. So let's think about that management data. That is also split down into two parts. There's the identification information, and then there's the status. Now, one of the things that we discussed last week with S1000D is how many different data module types there are. Um, and sorry, not how many different types, how many different data modules you might have in a project. And so one of the things that we need is to come up with some way of providing a, a coding system that we can understand as, as users, as authors, as managers, but that also uniquely identifies these potentially hundreds or thousands of different bits of information that are required to make up our project. So in that ID and status, we have the data module code itself. We also have um, information that covers the type of information that's in the content. And then we have a title of the data module, which is just literally the plain language version. And we have the issue status information. All of that identification is then pulled out into what's known as the data module code. And so typically we will talk more later on about um, information management systems and, and S1000D uses a, a particular type called a common source database. And we'll talk more about that later on. But even in a file system, our files have names that show the data module code. And so we can start to recognize how the information is broken down. When you first look at it, it's just a big long string of letters and numbers. DMC at the beginning, data module code. That's a that's the easy bit. And the dot XML on the end um, tells us whether it's XML or SGML. But actually, a lot of this, once you get used to looking at it, and again, from a an authoring perspective, this is one of the things I kind of want to encourage you to to get into, is it's actually quite easy to look at a data module code and read it. And you won't pull every little bit of information from it, but you can pull the important stuff from it. So this first part is known as the model ident. Um, and I, I'm not going to go into every bit of breakdown of the data module code. Um, as I mentioned last week, you know, we do courses on S Foul and D offering that, that last two days, and then we break this down into every little component part. But from a big picture perspective, that first block of information is telling you what I'm talking about. And in this case, Mecon Pubs, these are our publications that we write for our user guides and our installation guides for our software. Um, the N02 tells me that this one is actually about our Notus CSDB. And so I know straight away what I'm talking about. The next part of the code is actually the, the physical component. And we use codification to break it down into kind of the major systems and then the subsystems and then the sub subsystems. And again, that's kind of a whole hours lesson, well, not an hours lesson, but it's a kind of whole half hour lesson on understanding how the standard numbering system works. S1000D has a whole bunch that they maintain as, if you like, kind of generic examples for different types of um, platform and product. And then there are elements that if you use the maintained ones that you can add your own um, parts to, or you can just start from scratch and make your own one. And we do uh, a lot of work with customers that when they're setting up projects of doing that consultancy piece of actually building the standard numbering system and working out how we're going to break down the information into usable logical chunks. In my case here with my Mecon pubs, that U tells me it's a user guide rather than an installation guide or a uh, another information document. The 3030 and the zeros, I can't remember. I don't know off the top of my head what that is. Um, and I would have to go back and look at the um, either my offering guide to tell me what those numbers were 
or actually in my CSDB, then the CSDB can um, break my information down by the SNS areas. And so I could just look at the, the uh, table in the CSDB. The next part is the type of information. So every data module really has, has two elements that make up what the content needs to be. The first part is the thing that we're writing about, that's the SNS. The second part is the type of information that we need to provide. Um, and then also that last dash A is where the information or when the information is used. Um, so I might have a procedure for testing a component when it's still installed on the platform. I might have a different procedure for testing the component when it's on the bench in a workshop. And so that last letter there tells me where it is. The information codes themselves um, all come from S1000D and there are hundreds of them. It's a difficult one because you're never going to remember hundreds of codes, but actually what you find is there are blocks of codes that you use regularly, you know, and particularly if you're a technical author that that specializes in say, you know, let's let's say you're the guy that does the electrical systems or the mechanical systems or the engines or whatever, there will be a block of information codes that you use regularly that you will get used to. Um, I know all the aircrew ones when we're doing um, flight reference cards and so on. There is a whole series of in the 130s, 140s, 150s, which are specifically assigned for doing the flight reference cards. And there's pre-flight checks, in-flight checks, post-flight checks, emergency drills. And so I know and I recognise those numbers. Um, it's not because I'm a geek, it's just because I've used them for a long time. Um, and you can look at the data module code and you can start to recognise things. 040 is general information. So this will be general description about whatever the SNS is pointing at. And then the last couple of bits are quite simple. Um, the 001 is the issue number of the data module. The dash 00 is the in-work number. So that tells us whether it's actually going through editing or whether it's um, been finalized and issued. And then the last bit on the end, the ENGB is the language. Those elements, the, the top two, generally you define the product identification you're definitely going to find the standard numbering system you might use the s1000d um, maintained one but you're certainly going to add your unique structures into that the information code um, and the where it's used code the location code are maintained by s1000d so that everyone uses the same type of information codes and so on and then the issue, how the issue is structured is defined by S1000D and the language codes are actually just the standard ISO codes. Um, and we have both a, a language and a locale. So if I just go back with that on screen, so like EN, it's the English language. The GB tells me that I'm using the British English dictionaries and dialect. Obviously, if it was in the, the US, that would be an EN dash US. Um, we have an interesting one that confuses people sometimes, SX-US. SX is simplified English. And the um, definition for simplified English, and I, and I don't go into this too much today, but you know, if you want to know more about simplified English, give me a shout. The definition for simplified English is the American English Dictionary. So that would be the Webster's Dictionary. So simplified English will always have the code SX-US on the end of it. Right. The rest of the status then is a lot of supporting information. There will be stuff in there about the data module itself, whether it's a new data module, whether it's been um, changed, reissued. We even have a deleted status, and I'll talk more about that later on. You'll also then have a whole load of information about, for example, data restrictions. There might be a copyright statement. There might be information about who wrote the data module who it was written for and changes and so on that have happened over the life span of that data module over its different issues. Most of the status, um, there's one or two bits that are required, um, but most of it is really down to a business decision. Do I need a statement of export? 
do I need a, a statement about whether it can be destroyed or not? Do I need a statement about when it's issued and valid or not? And so um, when you're setting up your project or when your managers or teams or whatever are setting up the projects, these are all the kind of considerations that you take as to what information is going to go in that status section. We'll have a little look at that. Your first break from PowerPoint. And I've got here. Do, 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 do. I've got some scary XML for you. Um, so just the first couple of points about the XML. I'm using Notepad++. Um, it's a free download. It comes with lots of possible plugin tools, and it's really good for looking at things like XML, SGML, and so on. If I looked at this in Notepad, it would probably look something like that, which is, to be honest, almost indecipherable. It's just a stream of text. There's obviously kind of no recognition of any special elements in there, um, and it's just a continuous stream. One of the beauties of Notepad++ is I can go in here and I can tell it that this is XML. And straight away, we've got some coloring because it now understands that I want to see what is a, an element, what is an attribute, uh, what is content. And then some of the plugins that I have for Notepad++ here, I have one called Pretty Print. And it will clean up. Let me just do a save on that. Uh, the pretty print one, depending how good your XML is in the first place, will try and give you a more structured view of, do you remember I talked about these containers and kind of indenting things so I can now see, for example, that starts there and finishes there. And it makes it a lot easier to look at and decipher. That's still reasonably complicated, but it's a lot better than just that um, screen full of black text. So jump back to this one. Here is the start of our data module. So we've got some uh, information at the beginning, which I will kind of touch on later on what this is. These entities are quite important. These are our graphics and so on, but I'm going to come on to that later on. So our data module starts here and we have this ident and status section. And if I just collapse that down, you'll see that after the ident, we then get into the content proper. So the ident status, we have our data module address, which has our data module code in it. And OK, it's it's not necessarily easy to read it there with all the attributes, but that's where our data module code is. There's our language, there's our ENGB, and there's our issue info, our 001 and our in work one. So in work one is telling me straight away that this data module is not finalized. I've then got some more info in the address. I've got the issue date. I've got the data module title and we have the data module titles broken down into a technical name and an information name. And the information name normally doesn't have to, but normally will reflect the information code and the information code is up here as one of my attributes, and it's this 040, which tells me it's descriptive. And there you go, the information name says it's a general description. So that's kind of the ID bit. Then we get into the status bit. Now, the status bit can be quite long. So if I scroll down, there's the end of the status right the way down there. But you can break it down into blocks. We have a security classification. And, and obviously this 01 doesn't really tell us much, but we can look this up in S1000D and that will tell me that this is unclassified information. For a lot of things where there are variables, S1000D defines some of them and then it gives space for projects to define their own custom variables. Um, so again, you as authors, when you're setting up a project, you need to sit down. Um, I know some of you guys out there, for example, have a different security classification. So this will appear at the top of the page. And in my case, um, it would say unclassified. I know you use various different um, custom ones, so you can define your own in there. And then you, what you have to remember is that if you define your own value in the content, you've also got to tell whatever's displaying that content 
how to decode that value. So if it's an ITP, the ITP needs to know that your custom value means something different. If it's going to PDF for a print engine, that print engine has to decode your custom value. We then have this big block of data restrictions. These are the ones that are talking about things like export control, data handling, data destruction, and so on. These may or may not be required by your business. There's my copyright statement. Um, my copyright can either be a statement just embedded in the data module, or this could actually point to a data module that contains copyright information. And one thing you'll find in s d is we do lots of things by reference rather than actually repeating the copyright statement everywhere. Mine's quite short, doesn't really matter. But if there's a big legal statement in here, it's probably easier to point it to a data module and I've then only got to maintain it in the data module. Moving down, I've got the option to have a logo. So there's my first ICN and we'll talk about ICNs more in a bit. That's my company logo. And then we've got some information about the responsible company. It's us and the originator was us. But again, if you're working for a, uh, a maybe a prime contractor, that might be that you've got your prime contractor's details in there and then your details as the originator would be in there. A few more things we can embed applicability. Now, in the space of the afternoon today, I, I haven't got time to go into applicability with you, um, but applicability lets us have one data module that might have various different versions of information, depending, for example, on, say, build um, conditions, modification status and so on. In this case, I've just got a simple paragraph that says all, so all applicabilities. Technical standard information, this was obviously for version two of the software. Brex, and again, Brex isn't a topic for this afternoon, but I did mention Brex last week in the talk, and we have the, the concept of a Brex, a business rules exchange data module. And so we can contain a reference here to our Brex data module. We then got quality assurance and. You know, just shows how this all ties in. This is obviously currently unverified and that ties in with the fact that up here my in work number was zero one. So I said to you that meant it was draft and sure enough, the quality assurance is telling me that this has not been signed off. S1000D allows for two stages of quality assurance. You get first verification, second verification. Um, and again, it depends on the business as to how those are used. Um, you find that a lot of companies, for example, use the first verification for an in-house peer review of the content. And then the second verification might be an engineering sign off or it might be a customer sign off. Now, because this is a new data module, we don't have um, additional content down the bottom here, but one of the things that S1000D is quite good at is we can actually embed change information into our content. And I we will look at this in a little while. And in the end of my ID and status, I can set here the reasons why the data has been changed, and then I can refer to them throughout the content. And even more importantly, and we'll look at this next week when we look at building publications, we can pull that information out from each data module and build our highlights page that says in this new publication or this, this update to the publication, these are all the things that we've changed. And we can go in here, we can find what we want to be highlighting or not. And that's it, that's pretty much the end of our ident status and then we get on to the content. Um, so I'm going to jump back to the PowerPoint for a second, but you can see here the first element inside my content element is description. So I know that this is a descriptive data module. One other thing while I'm in here, S1000D has lots of different versions and lots of different data types. So um, we went all the way back. If you remember last week's talk, if you were on that one, we talked about the early changes that were based in SGML, and then we had various different versions of two and three and four, and we're currently on version five. In my data module declaration, and it does vary slightly between the SGML and the XML and even down to how the XML is constructed, but there will be a statement up here that allows you to identify the version of S1000D. In this case, 
I can see here that I'm using S1000D 4.2. I'm using an XML schema and it's a descriptive data module. So that's defined as part of the heading information. And it's that heading information that the system then knows what elements are allowed in the content or not. One thing to point out is that nearly every ident and status section is identical. There are a couple of minor differences with some of the specialist kind of management types of data module. Um, but in general, the ID and status is almost the same. So this is descriptive and we've got our DM address, we've got our DM status and all these bits and pieces. If I look at this next one along, this one from our definition, it's still S1000D 4.2, but this is a front matter content type. We've got the ID and status. We've got a data module address exactly as before. We've got a data module status exactly as before. The difference is this time is when we get into the content, we've now got front matter and we have a completely different type of content. So talking about content, let's jump back to PowerPoint. I did show this one last week and I'm not going to go for it into too much detail, but we broadly have two different types of content. We have the data types where we have information that we actually want to end up displaying to our user. And some of that might need some basic formatting. Some of it might need some really clever formatting um, and some of it can even be used, for example, to drive an interactive system. So we have this element down here called the process data module. Um, the process data module allows you to actually build logic flows and depending what the user responds, um, and obviously that depends on the system because if this is printed on paper, the user can't respond, but it could tell him to go to a different page or a different chapter. Um, but the, the user could maybe click an answer or insert a value and depending on the result would depend the next data module that gets displayed to him. On the other side of the page there, we have what are known as the management types. And so these are things that provide additional supporting information. You can see there we've got applicability that I talked about. We have our business rules exchange data module and then there's various other ones that allow us to do um, things within our publication or things within our content. One of the examples there is the container data module. There might be, if I'm using applicability, whole data modules that need to change depending on the modification state or the um, installed. You know, if, if I've got one customer has bought a, a, a product with one set of options, different customer has different set of options. When I'm referring, if you know, if I want to talk about the engines, it might be that with different customer options, one guy's got Rolls Royce, one guy's got Pratt and Whitney, and so they're completely different codes of data modules. Now, if I want to cross refer to that, that gets quite difficult because the code is changing. So what I can do is I can use a generic container data module that I can cross refer to. And depending on the applicability, that can, can contain the different content parts. So that's quite a powerful tool. Data dispatch note, data module list. These are a couple where that front matter is slightly different because they don't need as much. They don't need all the data restrictions and so on. Uh, the data dispatch note in effect is a delivery note if we're doing an electronic delivery to maybe our customer or to our prime contractor if we if we're um, subcontracting the data module list is a catalog of all the data modules that we think we need in our project and that list is normally dynamic it normally changes as we go along but when you're authoring that your data module code and your info code in effect are generated by that data module list and then use the um, the SNS to tell you what you're writing about and the information code to tell you what you are saying. That, as I say, it comes from the data module list, drives the content that you're going to produce. And there's various other ones down there for specific purposes. One of the ones I'll come back to in a little bit is the common information repository. Um, used to be called a technical information repository. Um, from issue four onwards, it became known as the common information repository, or even often information is dropped and it's just known as a common repository. Um, they're great for offering, and I'll, I'll talk more about those in a minute. 
one thing I will point out, I did mention this last week as well, but that you should try and use the right type of data module for the right content. And so the example I use is, you know, you wouldn't put a parts list in a descriptive data module using tables. You wouldn't put a procedure in a descriptive data module using numbered lists. And I've got a little example of that. Uh, this is FrameMaker. If you're not familiar, I'm going to look at mainly FrameMaker this afternoon because it gives us a nice kind of page based layout. Um, so here's a list of things. These could be steps in a procedure. Um, really simple uh, procedure there. However, this is a descriptive data module and these are actually list items in a numbered list. And the problem comes is if I want to cross refer to one of these, what I'm looking at as steps, when I create a cross reference, because they're not steps, I can't actually generate a reference to a step. If I go to a procedural data module, these are steps. And so in here, I can have exactly the same content. And then I can put in a cross reference. So if I find my step. Do, 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 do. If I remember the right one, insert boom. And then when I build that book, I've done this right and not let myself down, then that will come up and that will tell me go to step one. And it hasn't done. I've, prob I've probably linked it to the wrong thing, but there we go. Um, but it's generated the fact that it's go to step. And so if that was a ITP or a PDF, that could also be a hyperlink that I could click on. So as I was saying, uh, this is FrameMaker. FrameMaker has, in effect, two views. We have our structure view, and this basically is exactly the same as we looked at in Notepad++, except it shows them as containers, and where we have attributes, they show as uh, kind of a list of the items below the container. And I can do things like I can hide those attributes away to make it easier to read if I don't need to be editing them and so on. If I put the notepad back on the screen side by side with that quickly. I won't go into this too, too much, but you can see here there's my ident and status section. There's my ident and status section. There's my DM address. There's my DM address. So they, they work exactly the same. Uh, the other one I want to show you quickly, and I'm just going to jump onto my desktop behind here. It's probably easier to find it from my start menu. Just going to show you Arbor text as well. <laughs> I'm not going to show you Arbor text. Oh, no, I am going to show you Arbor text. I just had a warning saying that my license expires soon, but it, uh, there we go. So Arbor text, if I load uh, a similar data module, Again, we have this idea of a structure view and a content view, but whereas with FrameMaker, we have that page view. With Arbitex, we just have a, a constant kind of, if you like, a stream of the data. Really depends on your experience, both your experience of the two programs and also your experience with kind of using structured information as to what you find easiest. Now, this obviously has all my tags showing. I can change that view. Uh, let's get the right one. So I can hide those tags completely and just show me the, the output text. I can have 
the full display or I can have this kind of intermediate level display. So that compares, as I say, with the kind of frame maker view. Where you've got this full paginated. WYSIWYG. Um, this is obviously on A4 pages. If you be if you're in the States, then you'd have your your letter size page and you can have your fold outs and so on as well. So I'll concentrate mainly on the frame maker this afternoon, but from a structure point of view, the, the two work basically exactly the same. Normal day to day offering is quite straightforward. I'm just going to jump back into this descriptive data module. So. I'm going to collapse down the ID and status and I'm just going to concentrate on the content for a little while. So. In essence, we can use S thousand D like a set of building blocks. So you can see here I've got a level paragraph. My level paragraph has a heading number. I can go in here and I have this element catalog and I can, for example, choose a title. The formatting's taken care of. The fact that I've told it's a title, it's made it bold uh, and a larger font. I've got this paragraph. I've got this sequential list that I've already shown you. Um, in my paragraphs, I have all these different options in the catalog that I can choose from. Um, I'm going to cover some of these. Some of these are uh, reference items. Some of these are just straight display items. Um, there's some nice things we can do with S thousand D to make our book building so much better. Uh, one that I use a lot, for example, is an index flag. Because I'm generally producing manuals that are going to end up in a PDF or potentially even on paper, then I want to make it as easy as possible for my user to find the information. So we have hyperlinks, we have PDF bookmarks, and I also build an index at the back of the book. And the index can have up to four nested levels. And so uh, this is just a general paragraph. That would be my title. My index flag doesn't appear on the page, but it's been stored in my structure. And when I um, build my book at the end of all of this, that index flag would generate that para entry, that general para entry, and it would pick up the page number or the paragraph number or however I tell my software to build the index. And that, that's an important distinction. It won't automatically tell me it's page one. It will tell me what the software tells it to do. But it needs that element in there in the first place. I can do things like tagging acronyms. So acronyms are the bane of um, the life in the military world. Everything normally comes down to an acronym. And somewhere, somehow, we've got to tell the user what those acronyms all mean. Now in Thousand D, we have a special element called the acronym element. So Now, if I was doing this, you know, old school style, I would just type that out um, as text and I manually put the brackets around TLA. Um, but because it's just text, it doesn't mean anything to the computer system. And so when I build my book, it's not going to do anything with that. So in S1000D, I can wrap that whole piece up. In an acronym. And then I start to break it down. I have an acronym definition, which is the text part. And what I'm doing here is I'm just highlighting and then. By default, FrameMaker knows that if I double click an element in the catalog, it will wrap up. Remember, these are containers, so it will wrap up whatever I've selected into that new container. Now I've got a red dotted line that's telling me I've got something wrong here because S1000D expects that if I've used an acronym, I have an acronym definition followed by an acronym term. So the catalog is telling me I'm expecting an acronym term. So I can wrap up that bit of text in the acronym term. Now you can see it's automatically put brackets in for me. So all I need to do now is tidy up those extra brackets. 
that I manually typed because I don't need them. And I now have correct structure on this side and I have what looks the same on the page. But if I then go away and build that into a publication, it will pull that acronym out and use it to populate my acronym list at the beginning of the publication. So I can do that all the way through the publication um, and build that list without ever having to try and maintain it. You know, I haven't got to remember what acronyms have been used or maybe what acronyms have been removed from the publication and no longer need to be in the list and so on. That's all at quite a basic level at the moment. Um, internal cross references are really easy. Do this one right this time. So again, I can type I need to reference paragraph one. But if I get rid of that. And put in an internal reference. And this time we're looking for a paragraph. There's my para one. Obviously, I'm picking things from the list here. Um, S1000D has various rules as to how I create this in the first place. And obviously you pick those up from like an authoring course. Um, but I'm basically telling it that I'm referencing a paragraph. And you can see there now that the little bit of X reference code has been inserted. It's automatically formatted as paragraph one and it's referring to this paragraph here. Oh, sorry, wrong place. It's referring to this paragraph here. Remember, these were list items. And again, depending on how I output this, if I output it on paper, I just want it to appear as black text. It doesn't help me at all. But if I output this into a PDF or onto an ITP, that would be a hyperlink that I could click on. So just the same as we have references within the document, we can have references to other data modules. Now, one of the hardest things as an author to do is to sit and codify a data module reference. Um, they're a bit of a nightmare because there are so many components to it. So by using integration with a common source database, I'm just making sure I'm connected to a project here. When I say insert a data module reference, then it's going to list me the data modules that are in my project. And remember, I talked about using the SNS as a filter. Here is my SNS. So that U30 that we looked at earlier, actually, that's functions. And if I go into there, U30, I think it was free, wasn't it? it was the next one that obviously was referring to import export. And so I could reference one of these data modules. I think it was the 3030 and the 0400, wasn't it? So I can add some additional information. Let's make this really explicit. So we're going to refer to the issue number. We're going to refer to the language and I'm going to insert that data module. And there it is. So. That whole block of code, if you like. It's actually just a long list of attributes. But all of that has just come in for me straight from my database without me actually typing anything. I've just pointed and clicked at the thing I want. And because I've actually selected it, I haven't made any mistakes. I haven't mistyped one of these numbers or put them in the wrong order or something like that. So it makes it a lot less likely that you're going to make mistakes when you're authoring and editing. One of the other things that I go on a lot about with S1000D is you'll notice that I've put in the issue information. So this is explicitly referencing that issue of the content. Now, if that target data module changes in the future, this cross reference is still referring to that version of it. And, and governance is one of the really difficult things to get your head around. And we, we will talk about this more in the next session when we look at kind of publishing and so on. Um, but when content that is referenced changes, what happens to your data module that is referencing it? 
does this data module also need to change because the target has changed? Um, last couple of things we'll look at is figures are just as easy as um, data modules. So we have our ICNs. Um, this information, by the way, all these titles are coming out of the database. They're not coming from the actual file because the file is just a graphic. The file doesn't have all this XML information in it, um, but I can preview it. Let's find something a little bit prettier than that. Um, do, 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 do. In fact, why don't I actually use the SNS and find something? There we go. That's a bit nicer, isn't it? So I can insert that. It automatically sets up the file reference for me, and I'll talk about that in just a second. And there's my graphic, and it's picked up the title. I can go and edit that if I want to, but I don't necessarily need to. Now, in terms of graphics, let's just go back to my PowerPoint. Because all the data is XML, it can only contain text. And obviously in a graphic, the graphic in general, there are a couple of exceptions, but the graphic in general only has graphical data. It doesn't have any text in it. So if we want some kind of codification in the same way that we do for our data modules to identify all our different graphics, then the, about the only thing we've got available to us is the file name. And so S1000D uses the file name in effect to provide a code which has information about the graphic. And they call them ICNs, information control numbers. So S1000D gives us two different forms. Um, if you're not familiar, the CAGE code is the commercial and government entity. So this is a code assigned um, by NAMSA in Europe, part of NATO, to identify different companies that kind of work in, in this um, space. And most of you are probably familiar with CAGE codes. So in my first um, ICN, I have my CAGE code, KD559 is MECON. I then have an identity number, which has to be unique to the graphic, which can run from five to 10 characters. That's why I've put the second half in gray there. I then have the issue number of the graphic. Now, some people don't like up issuing, they just issue a whole new um, number. Other people keep the same number and just change the issue number. Again, that's kind of a business decision. And then finally, on the end, I have the security. So again, like we saw that security code of 01 in the data module, this 03 would probably be something like confidential. So we go unclass restricted confidential. And again, if you've got custom security codes, you could use those there. The second version, the model based version, you'll recognize this first half looks really similar to my data module and, and it is in effect. So in this second version, I'm actually identifying the graphic uh, or media by its place in the structure. So we still have our um, model identification. We have our SNS and then this second half from the KD5 is, is basically the, exactly the same. The only difference is this time we have a fixed five digit identification because we've already used the model information to to give us a kind of a unique breakdown. So we should never need you know, more than 10,000 graphics to um, depict a particular part of our product. Whereas obviously, if we're talking about the whole product and just using this cage code version, we could well have more than 10,000 images on a large project. Let's head back and have a quick look at the last couple of bits in FrameMaker. Um, so I've talked about inserting figures. I've talked about inserting data modules and so on. Now, the one other thing that we can insert, and I'm just going to change project here, is we can have information inserted by reference. I'm just going to pick a different project. The reason I'm picking a different project is because in my documentation, I don't have these reference files, whereas uh, this is just some S1000D bike data where they do have examples of that. Um, the example I'll show you is for inserting warnings and cautions. Now, 
things like warnings and cautions often are um well obviously important because they're warnings and cautions but the the wording of them is often defined you know at a company level possibly at a legal level people who have spent ages going over the wording to make sure that it's unambiguous and it's not potentially going to cause issues so what i don't want to do then as an author is 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 a have to sit and look it up every time or b possibly get the wording wrong possibly cause a legal issue in the future and so on so we have this idea of repositories and i can insert these items by reference at this point, Frame wasn't playing and my common repositories weren't linking back to the common source database for some reason. So we covered this again in the question time at the end and having restarted FrameMaker, everything was working happily. So I've just chopped the video around so you get the content here where it was actually relevant. Go. Right, so that's now populated properly. You can see it's pulled in the content. So this is the same data module as before. Where it said, um, ba, 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 ba. So these were in here by reference. So, for example, it just said caution 002. Well, that's now populated with the caution text and it's, it's doing the proper thing. So I, I should now be able to say under here. Oops, go down one step further, insert another caution. There we go. So just frame maker wanting a restart. So this is my list of cautions from that repository. I can select the one that I want. If I want to see the, there's obviously not a lot of XML on a warning and caution. Remember in your repository as well, with things like warnings and cautions, this can be a lot more complicated. You can include symbols in there. So you might have, you know, for example, a, I don't know, a, a red stop sign for a warning, a yellow triangle for a caution, whatever it happens to be. Um, select. And initially that's gone in, like that it's just caution zero two when i do the build and it's going to ask me which version the repository form well, it's now you saw it before frame jump you can see that that's now converted that caution to the actual text item so this is then the same with all of our spare parts and so on so if i go and edit those tables we have to do quite a few, if you like, little bits of trickery with FrameMaker to generate the, the printed view. So I want to go and add in a, an extra part here. Uh, pop, pop, so if I put in, for example, a tool ref, I think there's some tools. There we go. So it's gone away. It's searched the database. Have I got the right type of common repository? Yes, I have. Now I can choose my tool that I want. Let's have that one. Select it. Uh, I need to put in a required quantity. Let's have two of those. And then if I go back and format those tables. So there's that tool reference that I just inserted with my quantity two that I need. So that's come straight in from my repository. The idea is that you have the repository of information, you insert it as a reference, and it and it again it works two ways. One is you've got that content in as it was intended to be displayed. The other one is that in the future, if we go and update the content in the repository, potentially, and I, and I say potentially because again you've got to consider this governance aspect, um, but potentially we can automatically update all the data modules that use that content. So for example, this part number in here in this table, um, this is this tire pressure gauge. You can see it's in here as a reference. It's got this internal reference ID and so on on it. Um, if I was to change the model and the part number of that tire pressure gauge, then I could automatically update the data modules that refer to it. You've, you've got to consider the governance of do I need to also up issue this data module because that content has changed, uh, but it certainly helps you with managing, um, you know, project wide change across things like tools and spares, um, like I say, warnings and cautions and so on. So again, that's a bit of a, a kind of a, a, a fast run around um, some offering. Hopefully I've given you, you know, some information on 
why you would want some good authoring tools. Um, obviously get one where the common repository works. I will go back and look at what what's wrong with that afterwards. Um, but from a building block point of view, you know, again, this element catalog is invaluable because it tells me what I can put in, where I can put it in and so on. So let's wind that bit down. I will put my uh, final slide up on the screen for the afternoon. There we go. And if we have them, I'm more than happy to take questions. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. If you've got to this point, well done. Obviously, this is just a one hour touch on some of the aspects of offering in S1000D. And our full course is two days to learn S1000D offering in FrameMaker or Arbitex. So you can gauge the difference in the uh, amount of detail of information. We go into an awful lot more, not only on the offering aspects, but on some of the best practices like how to do change control and management, how to do book building, how to do applicability uh, and tagging for applicability and things like that. Also graphics and the implications of you know changing and up issuing graphics and how we treat them from a governance perspective in the same way that we treat data modules within the CSDB. If you like more information, then uh, there are links below this video. But uh, once again, thank you for watching.